Welcome to Picks with the Professor, the podcast where a real statistics professor and the Wally Coyote to his roadrunner, Jake, gives you sports betting tips. I'm Professor Sides. You can follow me and find all my picks on Twitter at Professor Sides. You can follow my friend Jake on Twitter at my friend underscore Jake. Today is Monday, February 28th, 2022, and this episode covers today's best college basketball bets. In case you're new here, I built a mathematical model that predicts what the spread and total should be for every Division I college basketball game. And information along with a graded A, B, or C pick for each of today's games not covered in this episode is available in the Google Sheet link in the show's description. A picks are the ones I love, B picks are the ones I like, and C picks are the leans. However, please remember that good and bad variants will occur. So as much as I'd like to say the model will be profitable each and every day, that is an impossible reality for any gambler. Uh, Jake, last weekend, the model did a bang-up job Saturday, and that was a lot of fun. Um, potentially, you know, I'd have to go back and look, but a record day there, plus 38 units uh, mm. held its own on Sunday. Uh, last week, overall, up 29 units for the week. Great week for the model. Great week. Incredible. Great week for the model. Uh, our podcast picks. Interestingly enough, um, I went exactly 500 on all picks given on the podcast, and you went exactly 500 on all picks given on the podcast. And, and I was thinking about this. I think it was two weeks ago. Uh, my picks were on fire. Last week, or, or three weeks ago, whatever, the two weeks ago, your picks were on fire. And then last week, we were both 500. And so if we come off of each one of us having an on fire week with a 500 week, we can live with that. Yeah. Now it's time for one of us to catch fire again, right? Yeah. The, 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 doesn't matter if it's me or you, one of us has got to do it, right? Yeah. Uh, what is one thing to know before we get started here? Hey, the conference tournaments start this week. This is it's big news. I mean, the NEC is the only one going today. And some weird schedule where they play today, off tomorrow, play the next day, and then take two or three days off and finish up on Friday. So a weird schedule, but they start today. It's kind of important to keep your eyes on, maybe not so much today with uh, Fairleigh Dickinson and Central Connecticut going, but there could be possible bid thieves that happen, and that changes how other teams play their last few games once that spot gets locked up or get or the assumed favorite gets in or doesn't get in. So it's, it's kind of something. Just kind of keep your eyes on the monitor, see how, see how that's going to affect whatever team you're playing. Chances of yeah. making and you mentioned that game tonight. Something I'm keeping my eye on that I, I just want to share with everyone, make sure everyone else is kind of keeping their eye on the same thing. Because I think it's really interesting if you bet totals. The total for that game yesterday opened up around 140. I made it right around 140 as well. And that total has come crashing down so far overnight. And I'm wondering if it has to do with the fact that in conference tournaments, we tend to see teams play a little slower, a little more cautious. So that's something to keep an eye on what totals do, because the last month totals have been uh, total points per game has been up by about two points per game over its usual numbers. So the line numbers have slowly been adjusting and catching up to that. But the scoring just been up so much lately and it's, this week's going to be a little tougher to tell, but it might be helpful if you pay attention to stuff like that this week to help you for next week, right? With this week, with some tournament games and some not, maybe pay attention to are the conference tournament games still having a lot of points going over, or are they starting to come down and be underplays while the remaining regular season games are staying higher scoring? Because that might give us a little clue as to what's going to happen next week when everyone else gets to the conference tournament. So just something to keep an eye on there. If you bet totals, what's happening there? Will the, will the run of high scoring that we've seen continue this week and into next week? It's something I'm very interested to see, um, to see if that trend continues. Uh, before we get to today's slate reminder, please hit that like button if you're on YouTube, subscribe or follow if you aren't yet. We appreciate both those things and they help us out greatly. Share with a friend if you know others in the game and drop a comment on Twitter or YouTube. We love those and try to respond to as many as we can. Today, we're going to get started with Northwestern at Iowa. It's a 7 p.m. Central tip-off. I'm going over 151. The model thinks the total should be 154. The model is 15 and four on Iowa over edges. We talk about how great the model had done with the Purdue over edges. That's kind of come back to about 50, 50 here lately, but the model is still doing really well with Iowa played Iowa under on Friday. I believe it was, and that game was looking under until there were 20 points scored in the last minute or something crazy like that with uh, some wild in, in game. So, so even when we thought we had an under with Iowa, we still couldn't get the under. So I, I still think let's roll with these Iowa overs. Uh, they have a great offense and a very average defense. Northwestern doesn't mind running. They have a better offense than they do defense. Their defense is, is a little better than Iowa's, but not by a ton. And so I think there should be a ton of points in this game. So let's go over 151 as I think 154 is a more realistic number for this total. Jake, can Iowa cover such a large number here against Northwestern? Yeah, in Iowa at home, they, they cover fairly often. They're 10 and 6 as a home favorite. They, uh, they're playing really well right now, winning four of the last five. 
And that's the complete opposite of Northwestern, who's lost four of the last five, with their only win being Nebraska, who's just really bad. Um, they're, they're shooting better. Everything is going right for Northwestern or uh, Iowa right now. They're shooting better. They're hitting their free throws. Keegan Murray's playing well. The defense is playing better than it has. It's still not very good, but not very bad. It's just yeah, it's just very little, average. Yeah, just a little better. Um, they take care of the ball extremely well. They rank uh, third in just total turnovers a game and first in turnover rate with the pace they play. And then they force 15, almost 15 a game. So there's about a six turnover. Uh, they're plus six in the turnover difference at um, – and that's huge when you're talking about an offense that's as good as Iowa. Giving them six extra chances over you is not a great way uh, <laughs> to beat them or to even stay within this number for Northwestern. So I think Iowa gets it done, gets it done very easy. All right. At 9 Eastern, 8 Central, we have Kansas State at Texas Tech. Tech is a 12.5 point home favorite, total of 132.5. I'm going to go under that number. I think that 130 is a more realistic number here. Tech tends to go over when other teams want to run. That doesn't always hold true, but more times than not, when Tech has gone over this year, it's because the other team has wanted to get up and down the court. When the other team doesn't is when they kind of tend to grind it out. Kansas State actually plays slower than Tech does, so I don't think Kansas State really wants to run in this game. And I think it will, we'll kind of compare this and contrast this with uh, the late game of the night when we talk about this. But when you think about how do you pull an upset, you have to, one, you want to minimize possessions, but more importantly, you want to do what you do and you want to do it well. So you, you if you can minimize possessions, you definitely want to do that because more possessions means that the better team is probably going to take advantage and win that. But a team like Kansas State, um, you know, that's that kind of plays into what they want to do anyway. They don't really want to run. And so I think that kind of aligns really well for an underplay here. Jake, can they limit the possessions enough to hang in with with this 12 and a half number, or does Tech just wipe the floor with them? I think Tech runs away with this. They're, they're going to be mad about the loss they suffered earlier to them. They're going to be mad about the loss they took on Saturday um, that ended up with, like, Kansas losing – so they they had that's the second time they've had a chance to jump up there towards the top of the Big 12, and they've thrown it away. So I, and I think the last time they came back and beat the crap out of Oklahoma was the last time something like this happened. So I think we're going to see a repeat of that, which also bodes well for your under because I think that that game barely broke 110 points. Yeah, <laughs> but the Texas Tech team is getting really good. They they've got all their pieces together. They just didn't have it. I don't know if they just weren't up for it or TCU or if it was going to be a wake-up call. That's kind of what I think happened here. It's going to be a wake-up. You can't just sleepwalk through the Big 12. And they are just shooting the ball so much better. They're hitting their free throws. They're uh, one of the premier defenses in the league and forcing almost 18 turnovers a game at home. So I don't see any way Kansas State, like even without trying, like trying to slow it down is not going to be a good formula for them in this because – of how good Texas Tech's defense is, and they're going to just force you into bad situations. I mean, Texas Tech can win a game up in the 90s and 100s, and they can also, as I saw earlier against a Tennessee team, they both teams over under 50 with with an overtime game. They can win both ways, and they, they don't really care. And I don't think Kansas State can win going fast, and they definitely won't be able to win going slow because I don't think their offense is good enough. But So I think Texas Tech is going to just run them out of the gym. All right, and then at that same time slot, we have San Diego State at Wyoming. Uh, this one should be probably the game of the night to watch, right? The most interesting one. Uh, I'm going under as well on this one, going under 130. The model makes this 128. Both teams have been under, and so my number saying under is a good thing. My, my model's a little contrarian, not by design necessarily, but my model is trying to balance out everything, and so it doesn't want to overreact to things. And so when my model goes the same direction the team's been playing, that's usually a good sign because a lot of times if teams are under my model saying, hey, y'all are overreacting, you know, not so fast, that sort of thing. And so given the fact the model's going under um, with two teams that have been under teams, I think that makes a lot of sense here. So I'm going under 130 in what should be a tight game. Jake, you're going to tell us uh, here why you like Wyoming uh, catching two at home and even though I have an underplay on this, I like that as well. Um, I'm curious to hear your exact reasonings, but th this number doesn't make a lot of sense to me here. Uh, this feels like it should be more of a pick on a Wyoming, maybe a slight favorite. I'm, a, I'm just a little surprised they're an underdog. Uh, yeah. So what do you have for us? Yeah, I was the same way. I was surprised they're this much of an underdog, really. I, I thought this would be a toss-up. 
Um, but San Diego State's playing extremely well right now. I just their offense isn't good enough. Like Wyoming's offense is leaps and bounds ahead of San Diego State's offense. And their defense is, I mean, San Diego State's one of the top defenses in the nation, depending on what metrics you use and what you look at. They're going to be, like, anywhere from one to three. Um, but, why, like, Wyoming's defense isn't as bad as San Diego State's offense. So, like, the difference between the two defenses isn't as much as the difference between the two offenses. And I think having the, the probably the two best players on the floor with Maldonado and Ike, PK, or how, sorry, PK, yeah. PK, yeah. Those, those two guys, uh, having those two would be able to go at it in a, like, in a tight game scenario where you can run a, a high pick and roll or two big men, like a, any kind of one-two game with that, it's going to be really, really beneficial to them. The way they hit Wyoming hits free throws is going to go well. San Diego State can be a little sloppy with the ball, so I think there's a mistake made late or, and, uh, or maybe a couple, and that gets Wyoming just enough to probably win this game because they, if they win this, I believe I haven't looked at all the tiebreakers, but I believe they're going to be, if they can win this one. They've got a great shot of winning the uh, Mountain West title. All right. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I think it should be a, a tight game. Um, uh, for me, I'll just be personally rooting for not overtime. I feel like, you know, one of those, like, I don't really care who wins. Just let me make this not go to, go to overtime. And, and if you're catching two and, uh, you know, San Diego State's up one. You might be in the same boat with if Wyoming gets the ball at the end, be like, make it miss. I don't care. Just don't get fouled and go to overtime, right? It's, <laughs> it's always interesting how those late game scenarios play out. Um, and again, that should be the game to watch. Definitely one to keep an eye on there. Um, late night, if you're staying up, uh, we've got 11 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Central. UCLA is a 10 point road favorite at Washington. I'm going to take over 140 on this one as the model thinks it should be 142. And I'm going to contrast this a little bit to what I said earlier, right? When you, when you want to pull an upset, that you do try to limit possessions. You don't want to have more possessions because that means that the better team can take advantage. However, you still have to do what you do. Washington wants to run up and down. And so I just don't think it makes sense for them to try to slow the game down in this scenario because if they do, they're going to get out of their game. And playing against a UCLA team that, while kind of sometimes confusing, is still pretty good. Right. And so and, and Washington, of course, pretty bad. Right. So when you're a pretty bad team playing against a solid team, you don't necessarily want to throw everything out the window in order just to pull the upset. You want to still kind of do what you do. I think Washington wants to run. Their pace is way, you know, is, is way above average. Usually they won't mind that. And I don't see how they can stop UCLA. Um, so I like over 140. Jake, can UCLA go on the road here and win by double digits? Yeah, I think they do it. Washington, like you pointed out, is very bad and wants to play fast. And UCLA will take full advantage of that because typically when you play fast, you turn the you turn the ball over more because that's more possessions of the game equals more turnovers, like whatever the percentage is. Yep. And UCLA does not turn the ball over at all. They're they're top three in the nation for holding onto the ball. Um, or sorry, top five, not top three. Um, but I mean, what's splitting hairs there? Yeah, but they shoot, <laughs> shoot free throws extremely well. Tiger Campbell looks like he's back, back at full strength after the last game. I think he had twenty points, and I think, and obviously Johnny Juzang and uh, Jaime Hawkes and Jules Bernard are enough on the offense to really punish this Washington team that is just not going to be ready for this style of game and this and this like talent level difference. Um, but I, I think UCLA gets them, gets them easy. And they've won four, four of the last five. Only, only lost being the three-point loss to Oregon, who just seems to have the number this year. All right, and then that takes us to Solo Jake here. Jake, I'm going to have you and you only give a play on this Baylor Texas game. You've done really well in these segments here. I've, I've put in the sheet a, a column to put your record. I need to go back and calculate. I don't know if you know off the top, top of your head here, but yeah, I know you've done really well in these. Um, you got, I know you got at least half of them last week, if not four of the five or something like that. Yeah. Um, my take on this, real quick before I tee it up to you, we talked about the Spangler team a lot. Don't really know what to expect every time you zig, they zag. And that actually played out in that Kansas game, right, in the first half of the second half. Now, of course, you can chalk the first half up to the fact they just – I think they went 0 for 8 from 3 or something, just couldn't you know hit anything. So uh, you saw a little bit of wonkiness there with that. But Baylor looking great at home against Kansas. Now traveling to Texas, they're a one-and-a-half-point favorite. 
Uh, I believe this is the last home game in the Frank Irwin Center where Texas mm -hmm. plays their home games. Um, and so the crowd will definitely be rocking. I don't know if uh, Beard has done any gimmick there, but they've done all sorts of gimmicks about getting students out there, about him buying pizza for the students and stuff like that. Either way, it will be a, a packed house. And so I, I really think anything can happen here in this game. The one thing that I will add is that I'm interested in the total. I don't really love the total. I'm really interested to see, especially with Baylor, they've tended to be a little bit more up-tempo now that they are going to a smaller lineup. They're not quite as much grinding it out in the offense. Um, this last game against Kansas, I several times had Sohan playing at the five. Um, and so just playing real small ball leads to a few more points. I'm curious to see if that trend continues, especially against the Texas team that knows how to play defense especially at home so a lot to learn and be i think it should be a fascinating game really interested. i don't really have a feel either way for this one but jake i think you do so i'm going to let you see uh if you could talk to people into one side or the other here see i, I like i like baylor in this their texas offense is just so i don't want to say bad but it is very inconsistent easy, it's inconsistent and easy to game plan for right it's make make timmy allen work and like kind of guard the three ball, right? And since they don't have a true post up guy, that's not like the going small ball. I think it was a great call by Drew with so so ten at the five. Like when I saw that happening in Kansas, I was like, this is one of the reasons he's just an incredible coach. He just sees the game well and he's ahead of the curve each time. And I think that because Baylor matches up well with Texas, how Texas wants to play offensively on their defensive end because they can really make Timmy Allen or it can make him inefficient. Um, they just got to watch out for Andrew Jones, make sure he's not having a hot shooting night. Uh, and then especially if they get that offense going with the Kenjo making shots and uh, if Flo Thamba plays anywhere near the level he played in that Kansas game, this Baylor team's a whole different ball game. If he's scoring like he did there, uh, I think he had 18 and 12. So if they can just get the, around the same kind of rebound production and you know, just finish buckets up for him, I, th I think Baylor wins this about five points or so. Uh, and I really, I just, and the Texas defense is very, very good, mm -hmm. but their offense just hasn't quite figured it out yet. Yeah. And I, I've mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, for those of you who are newer here, my, my father went to Texas and he watched all the games. So he talks about them and, uh, he, that's his number one complaint about this Texas team is their offense. He always talks about, they have five minute stretches where they just disappear. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that Texas tech game, uh, a little over a week ago now they had, I, I think it wasn't one five minute stretch. I think it was like two five minute stretches back to back. I think it was like nine minutes or something and they scored like two points. And so yeah. when they just disappear like that, it really puts a lot of pressure on their defense to get a stop every time down the court. Um, but they do play a little bit better at home. Um, again, that place should be rocking. So as a Baylor fan, I hope you're right. Uh, I think it should be a really uh, good game between the San Diego State, uh, Wyoming game and this one. You got a couple really good games to flip back and forth between there. Which takes us to our overtime A plays segment, 15, 12, and 1 last week. So hoping to build off of that. I've got two for you today. The first one, both of them in the swag. First one here, Texas Southern minus 5.5 versus Alcorn State. We've talked about Texas Southern a lot. They've been pretty variable. They've done better on the smaller numbers than the larger numbers. Overall, I'm 7-6 and six on A or B picks backing Texas Southern. So I like it here because it's a smaller number. Texas Southern has tended to more just fall asleep at the wheel when they're up 20 or something laying 10 points and that hasn't been a recipe for success but i'm hoping that this five and a half is a low enough number that if they fall asleep they can still stay outside of it and then my a plus play of the day 16 12 and one all season on that i've got jackson state plus four and a half at prairie view a m prairie view a m has been a very disappointing this year usually they're a stronger team than this my numbers have adjusted I'm not sure. It's just a chicken and egg thing. I don't know if it's the books or the betters, but either one of them have not adjusted to just how disappointing Prairie View A&M has been. I don't know if it's the books saying there's too many teams, nobody bets these games, no big deal or whatever, and they haven't adjusted their numbers, or if the betters haven't for the same kind of reasons, and so the books are respecting that. It, it's a chicken and egg thing. I don't really know which one. It doesn't really matter, but the bottom line is that um, I think that Texas, uh, sorry, that Jackson State is actually a little bit better than Prairie View a and I think they're pretty close to equal. Um, getting four and a half points on the road, uh, I think is a gift here. Home court, not worth four and a half anywhere. Even in the best atmospheres, you might give it four. An atmosphere like this, you probably would drop it down to, you know, two and a half or something like that. So getting four and a half uh, with Jackson State on the road, 
even if they're just equal. And again, I think they might be a tiny bit better. Um, I think that is a strong play there. Yeah, I re- uh, I've been looking back at this Texas Southern team and trying to figure it out. And it seems to me that they they take their foot off the gas and try to take the air out of the ball when they as soon as they get to that 20-point game. And that's going to come back to bite them. But uh, like in smaller numbers, they, they keep their foot down. So I think it's really good to go when they're when they're under 10. I like them a lot over 10 so far. I'm like, oh, it's getting scary. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, anything with Texas Southern laying that like eight, nine, ten number. I, I, now I've just, I've, it's like they burned us too many times there. I'm like, oh, it's, it's too many because, like you said, they, they try to take the air to the ball, which if you can do that is fine. But the other day they were up twenty, and all of a sudden it was a tie game, and and they won by two. So um, hopefully here, they, maybe they've learned that lesson and they don't try that today, or maybe they've worked in practice on how to take the air out of the ball. Maybe they can do it more successfully. I don't know. Hopefully they've solved that. But the fact the number's lower is a little bit more comforting than if it was, you know, up in that 10 range. Yeah. Then, then I mean, I, I like, I like Jackson state here. Prairie View A&M has been very confusing to me. They should have been a lot better this year, but I, yeah. I like the Jackson state play. All right. All right. And that gets us to our buzzer beaters. Jake, what do you have for us? I'm going with Washington State uh, minus eight over this terrible, terrible Oregon State team. Um, they're just the overall better team. Oregon State has yet to win a game inside the Pac-12, so it's just going to be a rough night for for them. And then I love Southern minus nine and a half here. They're just the overall way better team over Florida A&M, so I think they get it done 12 to 15 and we go home happy. All right. Yeah. Oregon State just really disappointing. Uh, not that we thought they were going to win the conference or anything, but I think we expected them to have somewhat of a pulse and they have just been abysmal this year. It's kind of crazy when you look at the outlier teams like that, just how bad some Especially of them after are. after an elite eight run and then bringing yeah. most of the people back. Yeah. Yeah. And again, we, we knew last year with the regular season that they weren't that good, but we thought the truth might be somewhere in the middle. And it turns out, no, the truth was they were as bad as the regular season. A little bit surprising there just how bad they've been. My buzzer beaters, uh, I've got three for you here today. I've got in the Every Dog Has Its Day version 2.0 here where I'm taking dogs, but they don't have to necessarily win outright. I want to take the 10 points with South Carolina State at Howard. South Carolina State is really bad, but they have overperformed my numbers. 10 is a lot. I do think they lose. I think if there's fouls late or something like that, I think they lose by eight. So I think catching 10 is a solid play there. The best B side, I'm 15 and 13 all season on this. I've got Maryland Eastern Shore plus three at Morgan State. I think Maryland Eastern Shore is the better team. So I like to catch three there on the road. Or if you're of the money line type, take that. Take some plus odds there. And what I think should be a pretty evenly matched game. And then I've got one total for you. I've got the over of the day, over 139 and a half in UMass Fordham. UMass is a strong over team. Fordham has been under my numbers, but hasn't really been an under team. And so I like the combination there. I think that can get into the 140s for us for the over of the day. Yeah, no, no, I like I like all those plays. I'm, I'm leaning the other way against South Carolina State, but it's I'm not very confident in it at all. But so I, I probably should be with you on that. But. You know, taking my chances. All right, all right. That's all we've got for you today. Thanks for tuning into another episode of Picks with the Professor. Reminder, check out that Google Sheet for picks and totals on all of today's games not covered in this episode. If you haven't done so yet, click that subscribe button for a new episode every weekday and Saturday during the college basketball season. We will see you tomorrow. Until then, remember, you can eat your betting money, but please don't bet your eating money.